よう待つ<笑>頭ガチバってやるよさらに武器はダサすぎね聞いてんのかこれお礼に俺もバカてめえのマジ気をつけて start of episode 22, we cut to a flashback of the founding members of the Tokyo Manji Gang. On June 13th, 2003, Manjiro calls for the gang to gather at a shrine. Excitement fills the air as he rides with Keisuke on his bike. As they stop at a red light, Keisuke boasts about his bike being the best in Tokyo, but the other gang members join in on the competition. The light turns green and Pachin zips past them all, declaring his bike the ultimate champion and igniting a race to the shrine. The adrenaline rush proves too much for Manjiro, who grows tired and falls asleep. Keisuke, concerned for his friend's safety, slows down and arrives last, carrying the sleeping Manjiro to the top. Upon waking up, Manjiro shares his desire to take on the notorious Black Dragons. The gang discusses forming their own gang, with each member taking on a unique role. Manjiro proposes the name Tokyo Manjiro Gang, which the others find uninspiring, but they agree to form the gang nonetheless. Keisuke expresses his desire for a brotherhood where they are willing to risk their lives for each other. Pachin suggests buying charms to commemorate the occasion. As the group heads out to purchase some charms, they're dismayed to discover that each trinket costs a whopping 500 yen. Searching through their pockets, they quickly realize that they don't even have enough to purchase a single charm. That's when Ken pipes up with a bright idea. Why not combine their funds and buy one charm? It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. After pooling their money, the gang purchases a single charm. But then something unexpected happens. Manjuro suggests that Keisuke should keep the charm, as it was his idea that brought them all together in the first place. It's a touching gesture that speaks to the bond between these friends. Fast forward to the present, and Manjuro finds himself clutching that very same charm. Memories flood his mind as he recalls the event that led up to this moment. Keisuke's vision for a gang that protects everyone was the catalyst that brought Taman into existence, and it's a legacy that still lives on today. But just as Manjiro is lost in thought, the sound of police sirens interrupts the moment. The gang knows it's time to make a quick exit, but Kazutora stays behind. He takes responsibility for what happened and insists on staying to face the consequences. As Taman flees the scene, Kazutora bows in penitence. He knows he can't ask for forgiveness, but he's willing to bear the burden of his actions for the rest of his life. It's a somber moment, and the gang knows that things will never be the same after this. The battle may have ended in victory, but at what cost? Two weeks later, Chifuyu solemnly makes his way to Keisuke's final resting place. The sun shines down on the gravestone, casting a soft glow that illuminates the space. As he sets down the yakisoba he had promised to share, memories of their friendship come flooding back. Chifuyu fondly recalls the first time he met Keisuke. It was his first year at a new school, and he wasted no time asserting his dominance over the older students. His ego was inflated with pride until he heard of a fellow first year student who had been held back. Intrigued, he set out to find this mysterious figure, but when he finally laid eyes on Keisuke, he was taken aback. Keisuke was unlike any delinquent Chifuyu had ever seen, a bookish looking guy with glasses and slicked back hair. At first, Chifuyu dismissed him, thinking he was just an errand boy or a shut in, but something drew him back to Keisuke, and he found himself visiting him when he was alone. As Chifuyu watched Keisuke study, he couldn't help but point out a mistake he made while writing the word tiger. But instead of getting defensive, Keisuke welcomed the help and saw the good in Chifuyu. They struck up a conversation and discovered they had more in common than they initially thought. While walking home, Chifuyu suddenly finds himself stopped by one of the senpais he had defeated earlier, who called in reinforcements from the Mandala Gang. Chifuyu remains composed and even tries to greet them, but he ends up headbutting their commander when they become aggressive towards him. He calls them out for being lame for ambushing a single guy, but manages to hold his own against some of them. 
However, it's clear that the odds are not in his favor as the gang members start to overpower him. Just as things are starting to look bleak, Keisuke arrives on the scene and chastises them for attacking someone alone. But with Chifuyu's help, he's able to take down the Mandala commander in one blow. The rest of the gang members quickly scatter as Keisuke warns them that they'll regret it if they ever try to mess with his friend again. Still reeling from the excitement of the fight, Chifuyu is taken aback when Keisuke asks if he likes yakisoba. It's a small gesture, but it's enough to make Chifuyu realize that Keisuke is someone he wants to get to know better. They end up splitting the one serving of yakisoba that Keisuke has, but the real bond that forms is between the two boys. Meanwhile, in the present, Takamichi and Ken visit Kazutora in the Tokyo Juvenile Detention Center. Despite the gravity of his situation, Kazutora is resolved to face the consequences of his actions. Ken urges him not to give up and reminds him that he's still a part of Taman, despite everything. What a heartful way to end episode 22. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is your favorite shonen anime? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. And now, back to the recap. After their meeting with Kazutoda, Ken drums a bombshell on Takamichi. Manjiro wants to meet with him and has a message that can't wait. Takamichi's mind races as he wonders what Manjiro wants to talk about. He's haunted by his failure to prevent Keisuke's death during the bloody Halloween, but he's grateful that Kazutoda was spared from Manjiro's wrath. He hopes that this act of mercy will be enough to prevent Eta Kisaki from seizing control of Taman. As they make their way through Shibuya, Takamichi is surprised to learn that Ken lives in a brothel. He's even surprised when a woman greets them at the door, scolding Ken for being home early. Takamichi is left in the lobby where he encounters a strange man clipping his nails. Just when he thinks things can't get any weirder, a girl named Remy appears and takes him to the shower. Takamichi can hardly believe it when she asks him to join her. Things take a sudden turn when Ken shows up and catches Takamichi in the shower. Remy is none too pleased to discover that Takamichi is one of Ken's friends, but Ken explains that he's all alone in the world and that the people in the brothel are like family to him. In Ken's room, Takamichi notices pictures of the gang and realizes that these people are all important to him. Ken admits that he wanted to kill Kazutora, but he's grateful that Takamichi was able to stop Manjiro from carrying out his revenge. Leaving his place, Takamichi lets out a sigh of relief as he reflects on his encounter with Ken. While he understands Ken's perspective, his heart still aches for Emma. With a heavy heart, Takamichi cheers Emma on from a distance, hoping that she will find happiness. Suddenly, his attention is captured by Emma, who runs towards Manjiro and embraces him. Takamichi's heart races as he imagines Ken discovering the scene and Taman falling apart. He feels his pulse quicken as he wonders what will happen next. Just as he starts to panic, Hinata appears, offering her own observations and theories. Naoto chimes in with his own insights, and the group decides to investigate Emma and Manjiro's relationship. Kazushi's appearance only adds fuel to the fire as he divulges some scandalous rumors about Emma and Manjiro. Hinata jumps to conclusions, convinced that Emma is two-timing the group. Despite his misgivings, Takamichi follows Hinata, wondering how the situation will play out. To his surprise, Ken appears on the scene, catching everyone off guard. Takamichi braces himself for the worst, but to his amazement, Ken laughs off the situation, revealing that Manjiro is simply Emma's half-brother. The group is stunned by the revelation, and Emma explains that she had already shared this information with Hinata. As Ken gives Emma her birthday present, a plush toy from the arcade, Hinata expresses her hopes for a happy future for Emma and Ken. Takamichi walks Hinata home, feeling grateful for her presence in his life. Just when he thinks the drama is over, Takamichi receives a call from Takashi. Takashi orders Takamichi to come to the gang meeting, and our protagonist obliges. On the way to the meeting, Takamichi takes a deep breath and reminds himself that this is what he wanted, to officially join Taman. As he walks in, he can feel the intensity of the room. Ken starts off the meeting by thanking everyone for coming, and then immediately launches into the first order of business. Takamichi can barely keep up with the fast-paced discussion, but he knows that he needs to stay focused. 
Suddenly, Manjiro bursts into the room with two other guys in tow. Takamichi can feel the tension rising, and he wonders what's going on. Ken introduces the two newcomers, and Takamichi can feel the weight of their presence. He knows that these guys are no joke, they're heavy hitters, and they're here for a reason. As the meeting progresses, Takamichi starts to get a better sense of the politics at play. He realizes that there's a lot more going on than he initially thought, and he wonders if he's ready for this kind of power play. But he knows that he can't back down now, he's come too far to turn back. As the meeting draws to a close, Ken turns to Takamichi and says, Congratulations on officially joining Taman, you're one of us now. Takemichi can feel a surge of pride and excitement. He knows that he's part of something bigger than himself, and he's ready to take on whatever challenges come his way. Everyone in Taman is buzzing with excitement as they bask in the glory of their recent victory over Valhalla. Manjiro, their leader, takes the stage and announces their win with pride. He thanks everyone for their hard work and dedication to the cause. Shuji Hanma, Valhalla's former leader, steps forward to speak. What could he possibly have to say that would interest the Taman members? Shuji explains that Valhalla has been without a leader for quite some time. As a result of their defeat, they will now fall under the control of Taman and become a part of it. The Taman members erupt in cheers at the thought of expanding their power and influence. But then, Shuji drops a bombshell. He reveals that someone brought the two gangs together. The name that falls from his lips is Tenta Kisaki. Takamichi's heart sinks. The mere mention of Kisaki brings back memories of a dark and twisted future. Manjaro tries to keep the mood upbeat as he talks about the sacrifices made in the battle. He honors the memory of Keisuke Baji, the fallen hero who fought so valiantly for Taman. Chief Fuyu Matsuno takes the stage to share his own thoughts. He admits that he was planning to leave Taman, but something changed his mind. Chifuyu tells the story of how Manjiro convinced him to stay. The flame of the first division was flickering, and someone needed to keep it burning bright. Chifuyu was hesitant to take on the role of first division captain, but he knew that Taman needed a strong leader to guide them. And so, he asked Takamichi to step up and take the position. Takamichi is taken aback by the offer. He never saw himself as a leader, but Chifuyu believes that he has what it takes to fill Keisuke's shoes. As he thinks about the future and all the promises he made, Takamichi realizes that he still has a chance to change Taman for the better. With a sense of purpose and determination, he accepts the challenge. Takamichi eagerly shakes Naoto's hand before returning to the present. Suddenly, he finds himself standing in the familiar DVD rental shop he once worked at. However, something feels different, and as he looks into the mirror, he notices his stylish new clothes and fresh hairstyle. Just as he is about to leave, the shop's manager, Hasegawa, approaches him and explains that they didn't have what he wanted. Feeling confused and disoriented, Takamichi steps outside and is met by a stranger who tells him to get in his car. Despite feeling uneasy, he decides to go along with it. The stranger reveals that they are headed to Takamichi's place, which surprises him since his apartment is not in that direction. Uncertain of what to do, he tries to call Naoto for help, only to realize that he doesn't have his friend's phone number. As they arrive at his apartment, Takamichi is greeted by a group of intimidating guys who he somehow recognizes. One of them complains about being late and tells Kazushi Yamagishi that he should have kept Takamichi in line. It's only then that Takamichi realizes the stranger is actually Kazushi himself. As he looks closer, he recognizes the other two guys, Makoto Suzuki and Takuya Yamamoto. Suddenly, Takemichi finds himself in the midst of Taman's upper echelon meeting. He is overwhelmed by the luxury of the building and the respect he receives as the gang's top executive. While there are some familiar faces, he also notices many new ones, including Panchin, Yasuhiro Muto, Naoya Kawata, Hakai Shiba, Sheshui Inui, and Hajime Kokonoi. As they argue and bicker, tension begins to rise and it becomes clear that there is a traitor among them. Just when things seem to be at their breaking point, Teta Kisaki appears, and everyone bows and greets him. Walking into another room, Teta confronts Takamichi and Shifuyu, asking if they hold any resentment towards him. He reflects on the tragic death of Keisuke, which he takes full responsibility for. 
With a heavy heart, Teta admits to orchestrating the bloody Halloween and manipulating Shuji to form Valhalla, purely for his own gain. His lust for power and recognition led to the devastating clash between the gangs. Teta's words are laced with regret as he explains that he never intended to harm Keisuke and extends a sincere apology to Chifuyu. Despite understanding that they may despise him, he raises a toast in Keisuke's memory. However, his words take a sinister turn as he reveals that he lied about Kazutora's involvement in the murder and that he is about to finish what he started. Suddenly, Takamichi awakens to find himself tied to a chair with Chifuyu beside him. Teta kicks Chifuyu and demands that they admit to being the traitors. Chifuyu concedes, acknowledging that he only wanted to rid Taman of Teta's corrupt influence. As Teta points his gun at Chifuyu's head, he fires a shot into Takamichi's leg. Chifuyu desperately tries to defend Takamichi and confesses that he had nothing to do with their plans, but Teta refuses to listen and executes Chifuyu in cold blood. Takamichi is left devastated and inconsolable, weeping uncontrollably at the loss of his friend. Teta yells at him if that's all he's got. As tears appear in Teta's eyes, he says goodbye to Takamichi, his hero, and pulls the trigger. What a tragic way to end the first season. Is our crybaby hero dead? We'll be covering the second season soon, but stay tuned for the Tokyo Revengers Season 1 review coming your way.